Um, this afternoon's first talk is Stoking Bletchley, the story of the Y services 1939 to 1945 by David um, Abrothnack. Um, uh, Bletchley Park was the home of the government uh, code and cipher school uh, during the Second World War, beginning as a small cryptoanalytic centre, working closely with the Y service, Army, Navy and RAF, inception, interception sites around the British Isles and overseas. Bletchley quickly expanded to become, one of the, uh, to become an industrial scale producer of signals intelligence and the Y service is one of the core providers of intercepts. It's poorly understood area of history and a significant aspect of uh, Bletchley's success. After serving uh, in the military uh, in the 1990s in the Royal Marine Commandos and RAF officer, David uh, joined GCHQ in Cheltenham in 2002 and has had a, a long uh, passionate interest in World War II military history and is a council member of the Royal Marines Historical uh, Society. He's a published author on military history, uh, 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 military intelligence service history, and became the departmental historian of GCHQ in 2019. He's the fellow. He's a fellow of the Royal Historical Society and the Royal Geographical Society. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for coming back from lunch. I think the organisers always value uh, when you do come back, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's it's uh, most certainly great to be back in person. Um, I was fortunate enough to do the RSGB convention last year online, uh, but it's just great to be back to see physical human beings again. I'm sure you all feel the same. Um, I'd just like to welcome JJ. I assume you're JJ, because you're probably the youngest member of the audience by a margin. Um, <laughs> a quick shout out for you, JJ. <laughs> Um, I'll maybe start with a couple of apologies, as, as I often do when I'm, when I'm speaking. Um, firstly, uh, I, I unfortunately can't stand uh, today. Um, medical science hasn't really progressed enough uh, for me to do that. And uh, my second apology is I will be using acronyms throughout, which unfortunately is the language we speak in the intelligence and military worlds. Uh, but I will try and expand on those acronyms so we, we roll on the same page. Uh, so certainly thanks to Steve and the RSGB team uh, for the invitation to speak. So um, Second World War signals intelligence history is dominated, as you all know, by the story of Bletchley Park and the outstanding work done against enciphered access communications networks just a few miles from where we sit today. But the second story of the Second World War is much bigger than Bletchley. Less well known is the critical role of the intercept and direction finding, or DF, Y service stations dotted around Britain and the rest of the world. Each arm of the British forces had its own interception services, which came under the Naval Intelligence Division 9 for the Royal Navy, Air Intelligence 4 for the RAF, and Military Intelligence 8, or MI8, for the Army. The Y services totaled around 25 to 30,000 staff across all of its British and overseas intercept and DF sites. <coughs> Ostensibly, the organisations can be split into two. The strategic intercept sites, which were typically located in military bases or at requisitioned war office sites, and the tactical mobile interception teams who deployed near the front lines. The interplay between tactical and strategic and across all three services was strong throughout the war. During the months leading up to the outbreak of the Second World War, the Y services pushed to recruit civilian operators, many like yourselves, for the main strategic Y stations around Britain. In the First World War, operators had been recruited from the GPO, the General Post Office, and the interwar period was defined by the shift of telegraphists from using Morse to the use of more sophisticated teleprinter machines. At the peak of the European War, there were 13 stations operating in the Y network, working exclusively to Bletchley Park. There are myths of the letter Y being derived directly from the word wireless, but we think its origins actually come back to the Royal Navy's use of something called Procedure Y, which started on ship around 1925-26 with the China squadrons in the Far East. 
This protocol used by the fleet wireless telegraphy officers on board was not popular as the task of examining intercepts and writing reports was tedious. Getting the intercepts transferred to the government code and cipher school in Britain was also very time consuming. MI8 was formed from MI1B on the 29th of September 1939 and was given responsibility for signals intelligence, including the governance and oversight of all the Y services. The unit was originally housed at 2 Caxton Street in London, but later moved to Devonshire House. For an effective Y service to function in a time of war, having a nationwide and overseas network that was interconnected was vital for the speed and ease to share intelligence on enemy transmissions. By November 1936, the Air Ministry and Admiralty were linked up. The Munich crisis in September 1938 was a catalyst for change and became something of a dummy run for the beginnings of the Second World War SIGINT effort. GCNCS achieved connectivity of Bletchley Park to the Y stations and the London office by teleprinter and telephone. Teleprinters linked the sites at Cheadle, Scarborough, Flowerdown, Denmark Hill, Chatham and London. The telephone exchange connecting BP to the GPO system grew to have over 750 extensions and 150 long distance private lines. The terminal of the Y communications network was placed at BP at Bletchley and manned by 26 group RAF personnel held on their Leighton Buzzard station strength. One of the most important underpinning aspects of the Y services infrastructure was the technical support provided by a commercial company, Cable and Wireless. In one document I've read, it is difficult to overstate the value of this company's system to SIGINT. Their role was hardly ever mentioned in the various historical accounts that have been written. The vast majority of Y services traffic from and to overseas stations were carried on cable and wireless infrastructure before the Y services networks were mature enough to cope with the volumes. MI8 was expanded and reorganised in November 1940. It had the following functions. Intelligence, which included collation and dissemination and the study of enemy and foreign wireless telegraphy communications networks. Number two, organisation, which included training of personnel, enemy, foreign, telegraph and wireless communication systems, procedures and equipment, and military Y organisation. The third function was policy and liaison, being things like developing and implementing Y policy and inter-service Y liaison. The problems of interconnectivity really didn't bear fruit until November 1942 when a decision was made to appoint a deputy director for the Y services who would be answerable to the director signals and the director of military intelligence or DMI although that approval did not happen until April 1943. So what of oversight? That was two main entities the Y committee and the Y board. The Y committee was formed in 1928 to bring coordination to the interception operations of the three services. 1941 was a turning point in the coordination of SIGINT in Britain. There was a growing need for simpler and better telegraphic communications and to centralise intercept materials for cryptanalytic attack. In October 1941, the Y Board approved a new approach to the Wireless Telegraphy Board, giving the opinion at the beginning of January 1942 to a new expansion programme to the Y services. As the war ran on, there was a pressing need to further expand the Y services and a programme was initiated to bring in more resources to support the work at Bletchley Park, so vital that the feed of ultra-intelligence was providing to Allied commanders around the world. They needed more interception sets. The DF exchange between the sites needed to be able to coordinate the order of more than 2,000 bearings per day. So an elaborate array of switchboard arrangements for connecting all the stations to the DF network, manned by Army and RAF personnel, 
was situated on technical grounds at the Bow Manor Wireless Telegraphy Station. As the military wire service collection effort expanded, notably with the opening of the Eastern Front, there was a need to acquire more stations. The Prime Minister Winston Churchill gave priority to the building of an additional Y stations. One of the first of the expansion programme was at Queen Ethelberger's <coughs> College at Forest Moor, just outside Harrogate. At the cost of £100,000, the site was acquired and refurbished and was formally opened on the 1st of June 1944 and was known at the time as the War Office Wireless Station. Two main blocks were built at the site, each containing three set rooms with 32 positions and a control room and personnel were provided by female ATS, Auxiliary Territorial Service personnel and supervisors from the Royal Signals. And what of foreign partners? As our partnership with the American SIGINT services was beginning to evolve by early 1942, the Y Committee invited Captain Brown of the US Army Signals Corps to review the entire Y service operational structure in the UK. Captain Brown was to conclude, I quote, the American Signal Intelligence Service maintained the closest contact and coordination with the British Y Service to the end that our units may be quickly trained to penetrate the complexities of the German system. In the spring of that year, the Y Committee continued this interaction with the Americans by sending a technical Y mission to North America. They subsequently reported that the Royal Canadian Navy had three Y stations. The Canadian Army had three, but the Royal Canadian Air Force had no sites operational by this stage. On the invitation of the British mission, it was decided Canadian Y service stations would be integrated with American sites to form a new West Coast network, which passed control of tasking rights to the Americans, which began during the six months between August 1942 and January 1943. The Canadian Y services could provide, on average, 6,000 messages per month, which was spread over some 35 different types of traffic. But this West Coast network played a vital part in the battle for the Atlantic, subduing the threat to Allied convoys from the German U-boat wolf packs. The Y board, under the direction of the Chief of Staff, was the controlling authority for the whole of British SIGINT, but it was not in continuous session. Much more detailed control was delegated to the Y Committee, or as it became known in October 1943, the Junior Board. The Battle of the Airwaves in the Second World War were hard fought. The Germans were adept at placing obstacles in the way of the SIGINT operators. They would regularly screen their transmissions with mil military band or operatic music, sometimes played their transmissions backwards and at high speed. Frequencies would be changed regularly and without warning, often in the middle of a message transmission. Added to this the fading of signals due to propagation and shifting atmospheric conditions or other stations operating on the same frequency made the work of the Y station operations Y services operators extremely challenging. They needed skilled and proficient operators. One of the key problems for the Y services was training wastage. On the 27th of February 1940, the Y services established a bespoke training programme at Trowbridge Barracks. Later in the war, this was moved to Bow Manor. It was called the Special Operator Training Battalion, or SOTB. The intent was to produce wireless operators who had a moderate standard of Morse and the initial phase of training was to last three months, six months, but it genuinely took another six months for them to be proficient. In reality, Morse operators would take two to three years of experience to reach their full potential. The aim was for the SOTB to produce 100 special operators every month. They had to draw on personnel from all three services, but much of the origi original signal staff had served in France with the British Expeditionary Force 
who had returned to Britain from Dunkirk. Later, there was a reliance on women from the Auxiliary Territorial Service. Operators had to get a required level of Morse. Those who had been carefully selected did not always manage to retain the benchmark and were taken off the course. Even the 120 post office wireless operators who were loaned to the War Office Wireless Group, over half of them were returned because they hadn't performed to the right level. The Kettleston Hall War Office Wire Station near Derby became operational in November 1942, manned purely by female ATS operators and commanded by supervisors from the Royal Signals. In 1943, the site installed additional aerial arrays which allowed them to intercept Japanese traffic. After VE Day, Kettleston Hall became the main training centre for ATS Y operators who had volunteered to deploy to India for the war against Japan. So I'll talk a little now about the three services. The RAF first established a Y service collection site at Branston Mere in 1922, just around the corner from RAF Waddington in Lincolnshire. In 1938, they moved to better premises in an empty country house that had been requisitioned at Cheadle, which was linked by landline to the DF stations at Montrose, Sutton Valence near Maidstone, Waddington and Lidford in Devon. Overseas, the RAF had developed a significant global Y service coverage network as far afield as Cairo, Malta, Aden and Khartoum. In 1939, they also had a mobile unit operational in Hong Kong. The RAF made the decision in the early part of the war to build Chicksands Priory in Bedfordshire into a station capable of dealing with all the mainline German Air Force traffic, which would allow Cheadle to deal purely with tactical traffic. Cheadle would go on to play a significant part in the Battle of Britain. The RAF also opened a station in the Dorset town of Shaftesbury and the standby site at Sutton Valence. RAF Chicksands monitored Luftwaffe signals from North Africa and much of Europe and the Russian front and at its peak had 200 receivers in operation. It also transmitted messages to Allied agents working in France. On the 25th of May 1941, broadcasts by Admiral Lugens, who was the captain of the German battleship Bismarck, were picked up by Chicksands, along with a few other stations on the East Coast, which allowed them to deduce the direction of travel through DF. The British sunk the vessel, as many of you know, on the 27th of May. Alongside their DF stations, a maintenance centre and a support depot, they had over 3,500 personnel. The Wireless Telegraphy Board agreed that the RAF, who were already installing their own long-distance communications network, should accept responsibility for providing a wireless telegraphy network for all three Y services. It was to be administered by number 26, Signals Group. The non-Morse chatter from Luftwaffe crews was picked up by a unit at RAF Hawkinge, but over time complemented by nine stations at Sutton Valence, Strett, Beachy Head, Shaftesbury, Gordonsdale on Sea, Capel of Fern, Scarborough, Ingold Mells and West Kingsdown. They were collectively referred to as the Royal Air Force's Home Defence Units or HDUs. And they were focused notably on Luftwaffe VHF tactical transmissions. Most of the staff at these sites were German linguists, familiar with the Luftwaffe operating procedures and slang used by the pilots. The HDU network provided vital warnings of impending raids during the Battle of Britain. RAF West Kingsdown pioneered a technique affectionately called ghost voices against the Luftwaffe. Operators at the site would tune into a German pilot's frequencies and pass themselves off as the Flight Command headquarters in Germany, effectively sending planes off to false targets or giving them incorrect coordinates. It was an effective game of deceit. 
The ghost voice technique was a foray into what we now call effects by the RAFY services. The main RAF intercept site at Kingsdown suffered bomb damage from a Luftwaffe attack in August 1944, which prompted its relocation to Canterbury. This proved a necessity as the Luftwaffe air defence units were increasingly resorting to VHF as the Allies penetrated further into occupied Europe. The RAF Y stations were subsequently moved to sites on the continent to maintain their collection operations. The origins of the Army Y services date back to the First World War. One of the oldest sites for the fledgling service was at Fort Bridgewoods, one of the defensive forts built to protect the naval base at Chatham. It was first used as an intercept site in 1926 with just one officer and two wireless operators working two watches a day and in a very Dickensian way had to operate at night using candles they'd supplied themselves. The site's original collect was against a Paris to Beirut communications link but over the course of the 1930s the site expanded and became vital for the interception of traffic during the Spanish Civil War. The operators before the outbreak of the Second World War developed their own techniques in what we now call traffic analysis. By the end of 1939, Chatham had 75 civilian staff manning 25 sets. At the beginning of the Second World War, they were exclusively assigned to work on German Luftwaffe interception tasks. But Chatham had only a small set room space, consisting of two small rooms, which were very cramped. The aerial field outside was restricted to just half an acre, which couldn't provide adequate reception for their mounting number of tasks. So the Army requested the development of another site which could support a collection effort of over 158 receiver sets. The only site that was found to be suitable was Bow Manor Park, originally home to Number 6 Intelligence School, just three miles south of Loughborough in Leicestershire, with its large mansion house and surrounding 300 acres of land for the aerial farm. The site and name of the new outfit was to be the War Office Y Group, which was to remain until the end of the Second World War. Staff began to move in, largely from Chicksands, in October 1941. As the site on the edge of the Charmwood Forest expanded, there was a shortage of skilled intercept operators. A new initiative was brought in to recruit women operators from the Auxiliary Territorial Service. And I found another quote. They have to have good hearing and have the personality <laughs> to work alone. Combat boredom for long hours when a radio group was silent and have the patience to sit like a cat watching a mouse hole, alert and waiting for the first sounds. Over time, the ATS would be responsible for 75% of the War Office Y Group's wartime intercept. Coordination on DF would be a critical aspect of this Y service work to locate enemy transmissions. But it wasn't until March 1943 that a DF exchange was built to link the resources of all these three services. And if you're interested in the work of Bow Manor, um, there's a book by Hugh Skillen, which is a, essentially a compendium of the in-house magazine, which is a real insight into their social history of the personnel at the site. And in my copy, uh, which I have, there's a hand-drawn picture of the site um, in the inner leaf. And I just thought I'd scan this in and share it with you, because I think it's beautiful. It just shows the layout of the site. In 1943, a special section was established at Bow Manor called the Frequency Measuring Section to assist with directional fixes on axis transmissions. All the War Office Wide Group DF plots that were taken were undertaken at the plotting room in Bow Manor, which was adjacent to the DF control. The DF exchange was installed at site, which enabled signals from any intercept site to be sent to any service DF network. Essentially, it helped combine the DF resources of all three services together, leading to a much more efficient operational use. The DF sites scattered around the country 
were typically manned by civilian operators. The HF DF sites included Sutton Valence, Purton, Chase Water, Montrose, Moulton and Thurso. Chase Water and Thurso also had um, uh, medium frequency DF stations alongside Chase Water and Crossbar. The War Office Y Group developed their own training regime to meet the demand for operators and a new course was created on the Isle of Man which lasted 26 weeks. The first batch of trained female ATS operators, which became known as SWAPs, Special Wireless Operators, arrived at Bow Manor in February 1942, and they didn't integrate well with the more experienced male operators. They were used to ATS women on the station at Chatham, but in those early days of the war, they were typically support staff. The new breed of ATS women were going to do the same work as the men. There were three grades of Morse speed, B3, which was 18 words per minute, B2, 25 words per minute, and B1, 30 words per minute. Depending on the swap's aptitude, the higher the grade, the higher the pay. Pays to be a winner. The early squads were posted to Bow Manor, and later, because of the significant numbers required, formed War Office Y Group units at Kettleston in Derby, Forest Moor in Harrogate and Shenley in Hertfordshire. By the end of the Second World War, there were over 1,300 <coughs> wireless operators working at Bow Manor. SIGINT was a critical enabler for the Allies in all theatres during the Second World War. The Y services created a number of what they call spe special wireless groups or SWGs who would serve army or corps headquarters. They were essentially tactical mobile signals intelligence collectors, providing SIGINT to the front line, which was particularly important for the British Army. Most of the personnel came from the Intelligence Corps depot at Winchester, many of which had a good grasp of German. Bow Manor ran eight to ten week long courses for these intelligence officers who were going to deploy into these tactical Y groups. Teaching upwards of 24 students at a time the nuances of German wireless systems. They typically deployed in large 10 ton trucks to support an army or corps headquarters with the provision of Morse or plain speech signals intercept. And I just draw out a quick passage from the manual of military intelligence in the field which states Wireless telegraphy is such a reliable and efficient medium of intercommunication that its use in war is indispensable to a modern army. Indeed, it is likely that it may prove the only practicable method of signal communications in campaigns involving rapid movements over long distances. And I'll just draw out one example from an SWG. It began as four company war office signals created in 1934 which morphed into two company CHQ signals in 1938 and was deployed into France with the British Expeditionary Force in 1939. After the evacuation at Dunkirk, the unit was rebadged 1SWG on the 6th of July 1940. During the Normandy campaign, the unit was attached to 21st Army Group, assisting both 2nd British Army and the 1st Canadian Army. At the end of the Second World War, the unit was rebadged again as the first special wireless regiment, which would evolve into what would become what is now known as 13 Signals Regiment. At the beginning of the war, the Naval Y Service consisted of under 200 personnel, who manned 50 receivers in 20 stations, ranging from Scarborough, which had 20 receivers, to single channel DF stations. By early 1945, the numbers had increased to nearly 5,500 personnel, with 450 receivers operating ashore and hundreds afloat. There were 60 stations, of which Scarborough, being the largest, manned 130 receivers. By 1945, one man in 140 
which a total Royal Navy headcount of 790,000, was engaged in Y interception and DF. The photograph on the left there, by the way, is um, my hometown, the, what is known as the OIC's cottage on the old site in Scarborough, uh, which was formally established in 1912, the oldest, um, and became a SIGINT site from 1914, the oldest collection site in the world. The main interception sites of the Royal Navy were Scarborough and Flowerdown near Winchester. The German Navy's radio network relied on three main stations, Berlin, Lorient and Paris. The U-boats relied on a fourth on the German coast near Emden. The U-boats had to receive HF transmissions, either on the surface or in shallow water, no more than 30 foot depth. Each U-boat had to respond to each message to provide a localised weather report at their location and any details of convoy sightings. These transmissions exposed their location and allowed British DF sites to pinpoint their location through their global DF network. In Britain alone, the Navy maintained DF stations as far afield as Wick, Coupar, St Just in Cornwall, Cooling Marshes, Shetlands, Winchester and Scarborough. Globally, these stretched the coverage to Accra, St Helena, Iceland, Gibraltar, Tristan de Cunha, Bermuda and the Caribbean. Many of the Royal Navy ships during the war had deployed Y teams on board. I've just pictured one example here, which is HMS Renown. That ship had two sub lieutenants, one flying officer from the RAF, and six Royal Navy operators who worked alongside six RAF operators. Teams typically would consist of just two to three officers and would needed to be specially selected for their roles. And they had a distinct type of vetting because they would have to be entrusted with the handling and use of ultra information from Bletchley Park. In May 1943, the Y Board put forward a proposal that SIGINT and the Y authorities should have representation on the planning for Operation Overlord to assist with the coordination between Allied Y Service resources. This coordination on the planning for Operation Overlord, sorry, this coordination began in January 1944 with a sequence of four meetings at Bletchley. Benefiting from the convoy experiences to Russia and Malta, the RAF had provided a shipborne Y party for early warning against air reconnaissance or attack during the op-torch landings in North Africa during November 1942. Coordination was poor between the RAF party, the Navy Y party for anti-submarine protection and a radar filter unit, even though they were barked on the same vessel. There was also no contact between the shipborne RAF Y units and the wireless units which accompanied the landings. Both of them endeavoured to supply an early warning service against German and Italian Air Force attacks on the port of Algiers and provide an effective radar screen. The time lag in the passage of intercepts between the Y service sites and Bletchley Park was noted as a matter of some anxiety and irritation. Prior to the op Operation Torch landing, significant efforts were made by the Bletchley Directorate and heads of section to cut down the time lags on transit. Many hours had been eliminated by the construction of the new communications section at Bletchley. There were also some additional GPO landlines procured to assist with connectivity. The invasion of Sicily, Operation Husky, in July 1943 was another opportunity to test the interoperability of the shipborne Y parties. It proved to be a good dress rehearsal for the invasion of Normandy in June 1944. The disastrous raid on Dieppe had shown that low-grade signals intelligence needed to be interpreted at one central hub before being assessed and presented to senior military commanders. Allied commanders were to mute the idea of having a headquarters ship which would act as a command and control communication centre for the three services taking part in Overlord. It would need to be located close to the Normandy coast and have deployed SIGINT staff on board to collect and intercept German military signals during the battle, but also to receive timely SIGINT 
from back in Britain, produced by the Y Services and Bletchley Park. For the Normandy landings, the Royal Navy introduced three Fighter Direction Tenders, or FDTs, whose mission was to protect the beachhead. They had been converted for the most suitable ships available at the time to the Royal Navy, HMS Boxer, Bruiser and Thruster, and were to be their allies, eyes and ears in the critical period of Operation Neptune. In the early stages of the landings, the three FDTs, FDT 13, 216 and 217, were to be responsible for providing immediate tactical intelligence from radio intercept to the controller of fighters back in England. Their role was vital for the RAF and US Air Force to dominate the airspace above Normandy to protect the huge logistical chain from the south coast of England. The Luftwaffe had been decimated through a concerted bombing campaign in northern France in the preceding weeks and they had less than 300 operational aircraft by D-Day. Fitting out the three of the FTTs with the most sophisticated communications and radar equipment available began in February 1944. The FITs included a new Type 11 radar system which could operate on German frequencies and was situated on the deck with a rotating gantry. Each FTT had in the region of 250 highly trained military staff, most of whom were RAF radar and communication specialists. One role the FTT teams would play would be as a deployed Y service collection platform to intercept German wireless communications from ashore, most notably those command and control communications networks between ships, between Luftwaffe ground control to airborne pilots or from ship to shore. As I mentioned, Overlord had learnt many lessons from Dieppe in 1942, and Allied planners had understood that an operation the size and scale of Overlord would require very effective command and control communications and effective radar and radio countermeasure plans. The former passenger liner HMS Hillary was employed as a headquarters and SIGINT ship for the commander of Naval Force J on Juno Beach. Hillary also had a number of other HQ sister ships. HMS Largs, which was operating off Sword Beach with Force S, HMS Bololo, which was operating off Gold Beach with Force G. These three vessels were referred to as Headquarters Landing Ships, or HQLS. They were responsible for control and management of the Neptune landings and of all the naval vessels taking part in the operation into the designated zones and beaches. It was Hillary that would distribute air raid warnings over the invasion fleet with intelligence gleaned from the FDT Y service teams. The ships were in place on the 6th of June 1944. FDT 217 positioned itself five miles off Juno, Sword and Gold Beaches, covering the eastern or British and Canadian sections of the assault area, whilst FDT 216 was off Omaha and Utah Beaches, covering the western or American part of the assault area. FTT-13 was located 40 miles off Gold Beach in the main shipping channels for convoy protection. They were all in position by 0430 hours and sequenced to have their full radar operating by 0225 hours, breaking their radio silence. FTT-217 was to be the master control vessel, choreographing Allied fighters dependent on the disposition of and the threat from Luftwaffe fighters operating in the region. The FTT ships were to stay in position for 17 days after D-Day, providing vital support to the Allied push into the hinterland. It's been estimated that 76 German aircraft were destroyed as a result of these FTTs. Of equal importance was the function these FTTs played in the collection of tactical intelligence for the Allied force. The intelligence Y group sections on board each of the three FTTs were critical in listening into the German wireless communications and conveying their, their significance in near real time to the commanders on the ground or on board ships. Some of the radio intercepts by the Y teams merged with their own DF capability on board resulted in successful interceptions of enemy aircraft. It was a huge advantage having deployed Y service capability on board to give advance warning of German Luftwaffe attacks and to aid identification. At the end of the Second World War, there was a wholesale review of the Y services. A subcommittee was formed to estimate the post-war tasks 
and resources required. They envisaged a post-war effort of around two-thirds of the scale in the UK, Mediterranean Basin, east of Suez, and a mobile transportable capability. In 1946, Air Chief Marshal Sir Douglas Evil was appointed to carry out the review. The Chiefs of Staff subsequently agreed that SIGINT communications would be an RAF responsibility and they were included in the RAF main telecommunications system four-year plan. In the immediate post-war years, the Y services relied heavily on the Typex for enciphering their communications, although this was superseded by the one-time tape system ROCKEX. Telling a comprehensive and justifiable account of the contribution of the Y services to the Second World War is difficult, as the story of their work is vast. But just an example of the scale of the operation. In just one week, in November 1944, the daily traffic average on the Y network that week was 225,045 groups inwards and 55,972 gr 970, groups outwards. And on the cable and wireless network, 76,738 groups inwards and, and 21,839 groups outwards. It is marked that the Y service contribution to the Second World War has not had the kudos it should. What is certain is that they were a vital cog in the machinery of British SIGINT and laid the foundation of what was to be taken forward into the Cold War. Thank you very much for listening, ladies and gents. Right, if there's any questions, raise your hands and I'll run over with the microphone. <laughs> Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Is there a transcript available? Mm. We, we can make one, yeah. Yep. Thank you. Mm. Any more questions? Thanks. You talked about um, about using direction finding to locate U-boats in, in World War II. Yep. With what sort of accuracy could that di direction finding uh, result in? Well, that's a, a very good question, and from memory, um, I think they could, at the height of the war and the best of their capability, which was probably 1943 to 44, um, certainly in the North Atlantic, they could pinpoint down to 100 metres. I think, off the top of my head. Obviously, it was a big coordination effort between that <coughs> West Coast network, which I mentioned, with a lot of DF stations on the American coast and the Canadian coast, and obviously depending on the U-boat transmissions and lots of other um, aspects of intelligence as well. Yep. Good afternoon, uh, David Howell, M0VTG. Um, it occurs to me during your talk, and I've thought about this previously, that films such as The Battle of Britain and Sink the Bismarck and all that really need to be reshot to bring into account all the information you've given us this afternoon. What's your opinion on that? Well, they could, but it wouldn't probably be that interesting. Um, um, yeah, I mean, that we, we've all, you know, I've been I'm a child of the 70s and, you know, still um, look back with affection those wonderful 1950s and 60s war films, which have, you know, have stood, some of them have stood the test of time. Um, but certainly, you know, the, the stories that have been told, certainly about Bletchley Park, you know, the imitation game is a, is a, is a classic one, have very much had that Hollywood touch. And so they're very, very far from truth about what actually happened. And but they, you know, that's they, they're trying to convey to a wide audience uh, and you know sell cinema tickets ultimately. So, but certainly there's a need for more documentary um, work on the work and of certainly the Y services, but also um, the talk I did last year, the Radio Security Service, because the stories are just fascinating. Um, and there's so little known and, and have, have actually been written about those two, those two entities. Um, there's been a lot written about Bletchley and um, a, lot, a lot of documentaries done about them, but you know, Bletchley's just the, you know, essentially the crypt analytic centre, the sorting house uh, for enciphered communications. You know, the whole SIGINT picture was much bigger than that, much bigger enterprise. Mm. The wider.
Any more questions from anybody? Hello, Mark Ribbons, M0 UMG. Um, for such a huge uh, operation that's now um, in public knowledge, was there at the time uh, any indication that the, the enemy of the time knew what we were up to and therefore developed their own sort of counter-counter operations against ASIGINT? Yes, uh, in a nutshell. Um, the German equivalent Y service um, organisations uh, were, were a very, very professional outfit, and certainly they had ve because of the way their federal structures operated with the, the Nazi regime and the, the, um, uh, the, the military uh, intelligence services, all had quite a disparate command and control, all worked in fairly big stovepipes, and there was not a lot of interplay between those. So there was a lot of, a lot of duplication going on with the Germans. Um, but they were fully aware of what we were capable of. Um, and uh, just a classic example of that, um, if we're talking about Enigma and Typex, I mentioned Typex. The Germans had an inkling that we were breaking Enigma. Um, certainly um, the higher echelons of, of the German uh, military intelligence service, the, the Abwehr, firmly suspected the, Ab the Enigma had been broken. The Germans had actually captured our um, British cipher machine, the Typex, at Dunkirk and in North, North Africa and the Battle of Tobruk and never really progressed um, understanding how the machine operated let alone had any real inroads into the cipher system and there was almost a degree of arrogance because how could possibly the British break the Enigma it was unbreakable so why would we bother um, going after the Typex cipher uh, which was play to our advantage because that w the, the Typex machine and the underlying cipher was the mainstay for the Allies um, and ciphered traffic all around the world right the way through from about 1942 onwards, even after the war. Okay, thank you very much everybody. Um, we've sort of run out of time for more questions. I want to thank uh, David for a very interesting <coughs> talk. Um, you know, the, uh, as he said, this is a vast subject that you know, in 45 minutes, we can only only touch on the periphery of. So, um, <coughs> I'd like to show your appreciation, if you would. Thank you very much. <laughs>